Hey everyone, so this is the latest film in our sense making series, all about the problem of truth in the digital age. So if the last couple of films were about the failure of the traditional media, this is about the alternative media, the hopes and the failure conditions of that. In particular, this is about how we split into warring tribes online, how that tribalism is enforced and what we might be able to do about it, introducing some really interesting frameworks and also talking about mimetic mediation between the different online tribes. And it's also about where some really important things seem to be shifting on the front lines of the culture war. And the biggest frame, as I think I've said before, is that I feel that we're in this interregnum period between two worlds. We're seeing the accelerated collapse of the existing structures, particularly the sense-making structures, but we don't yet have a decentralized network solution to the problem of truth. You could imagine that we might have one, but right now we're in this kind of no man's land. And if the previous films were really about the, the problems and the ongoing accelerated collapse of the traditional media, this is what are the failure conditions of the alternative media and is there anything that we might be able to do about it? And hopefully there's a few signs of hope in this film. So the first couple of films really looked at the crisis in journalism, how it was increasingly being replaced with activism and ideological conformity. So this is going to look much more closely at the alternative media, at the online media, and in a way the problem is worse there because most online sites don't even really aim for balance. They don't really aim for showing both sides of the story. And as Tristan Harris explained in the recent film that we put out, that's because the incentive structure of the online world actually selects for polarization, division, and fixed ideas. To get attention within that, that sphere, I have to use outrage. So both sides, the left and the right, are using outrage to get people to get, to get people's attention. That's what causes this kind of what we call the race to the bottom of the brainstem uh, for attention. So what it also selects for is a type of interacting that relies on ridicule, it relies on dunking, it relies on bad faith. And bad faith is something I'm going to come to in the next topic because I think we desperately need a definition of what bad faith is. So it's not just a subjective judgment that means I don't have to talk to this person or I don't have to talk to this person. Um, and we've covered the intellectual dark web on this program before quite a lot because it was deliberately set up to be a place beyond that polarization spiral, a place with a certain type of good faith argumentation. I've also explained why I think it fell short of those aims and where it got stuck and turned into a bit of a tribalism itself. But why I was really excited when the intellectual dark web was first named in 2018 was I'd seen the collapse of journalism accelerated by the digital wave and this was the first kind of emergent phenomenon that looked like it might be trying to tackle the problem. The idea that someone like Joe Rogan, like Sam Harris, like Dave Rubin, they had found a niche outside the mainstream, outside the traditional media, and they'd become very popular. So it was a, it was a genuine emergent phenomenon. They'd sort of grown in the cracks left by the mainstream media, by the traditional media. But I think if we're even gonna start to deal with the problem, we have to understand what's going on at a much deeper level than just the surface conflict. We need to understand how, for example, the tech platforms are leveraging the lower angels of our nature as Tristan Harris explained, there's a, a race to the bottom of the brainstem, looking for limbic hijack, looking for polarization, looking for outrage. And it's not even, in a way, it's not the tech platform's fault because they're in an incentive structure where if they're not doing it, then one of their competitors is gonna do it. And ultimately what it's showing up is that we are in a self-terminating system. The underlying dynamics that are leading to the self-termination that people feel and sense right now are not different in kind than the ones that we've been facing since the beginning of what we call civilization. They're different in magnitude and in the speed of process factoring the exponential curves involved. That The tech platforms are just magnifying a really deep flaw with the source code of society. Rival risk dynamics multiplied by exponential tech self-terminate. Exponential tech is inexorable. We cannot put it away. So we either figure out anti-rivalry or we go extinct. The human experiment comes to a completion. That's like, that's the core thing. Figuring out anti-rivalry is a psycho-spiritual process inside of ourselves. Can we actually even get along with our family members? Can we pay attention to our emotions and triggers that hijack us from sovereignty? Because the moment I'm getting pissed and my value system is not to be an angry person, I'm actually hijacked. 
right? Can I pay attention to that and actually have some sovereignty over my own inner state and how I show up in the world? And I think the really key piece to understand what's going on is Venkatesh Rao's The Internet of Beefs, where he describes how the incentive structure of social media has created a toxic landscape that is not only allowing bad behavior, but actively rewarding bad behavior. He explains in this how the internet has been transformed into an online battle zone that he calls the internet of beefs. A beef only thinker is someone you cannot simply talk to. Anything that is not an expression of pure unqualified support for whatever they are doing or saying is received as a mark of disrespect and a provocation to conflict. From there, you can only crash into honor-based conflict mode or back away and disengage. Online public spaces are now being slowly taken over by beef-only thinkers as the global culture wars evolve into a stable, endemic, background societal condition of continuous conflict. As the great weirding morphs into the perma-weird, the public internet is turning into the internet of beefs. So Twitter is absolutely core to this battle. It's where you can see the tribes being formed and enforced and policed in real time. And it has a huge effect on the stories that are being covered by the traditional media, as Barry Weiss said in her resignation letter. Twitter is not on the masthead of the New York Times, but Twitter has become its ultimate editor. As the ethics of that platform have become those of the paper, the paper itself has increasingly become a kind of performance space. Stories are chosen and told in a way to satisfy the narrowest of audiences, rather than to allow a curious public to read about the world and then draw their own conclusions. So another really essential framework is by Peter Lindbergh and Connor Barnes in their Culture War 2.0 paper, where they introduced the concept of mimetic tribes and listed a lot of the different mimetic tribes. Mimetic tribes, uh, you're probably familiar with some of the names that are active in the culture war, whether they be the social justice activists, Black Life Matters, uh, Me Too, Alt-Right, Manosphere, uh, we can even say the new atheist or rationalist, post-rationalists, street epistemologist, any sort of worldview that's sort of defining what culture is and, and sort of imposing their view on it. And we, we created the spreadsheet where we had a taxonomy, this meta taxonomy that had uh, uh, telos, their, their main purpose, what, what's their, their goal, um, existential threat, what are they most worried about, uh, mental models, how they, how they view the world their sacred values, what do they view most important that if you transgress it, you'll trigger them. And I think, you know, a trigger warning applies to all mimetic tribes, all sort of worldviews. And the idea is that these mimetic tribes are all combating with each other and all these odd alliances are forming. And the overall theme of the piece was that the old culture war, which could easily be split into left and right, was now fragmenting into a multipolar war. And I think you can see that, that a lot of the most intense conflicts are between people who are theoretically on the same side. The example of Barry Weiss at the New York Times being a perfect example. I mean, Barry, Barry Weiss was a liberal, uh, would agree with most things that other people in the New York Times would agree with, but they were split on this central culture war issue of whether the woke left had gone too far or not. And that was the central, that was by far the most heated division. There's conservative columnists at the New York Times, they don't create anywhere near as much heat as Barry Weiss received while she was there. As she explained in her resignation letter, the level of animosity towards her was just extreme. So the key to understanding the landscape of mimetic tribes is to understand that each one has some part of the truth. They're all often right about the certain part of the map that they're looking at. But in a way, it's like the blind man and the elephant. There's all these blind men, they're touching an elephant and they view their point on the elephant, where they're touching either the trunk or, or the tail, as their reality. And what the good thing about that is, is that they're hyper-focused on that area. They feel the texture, they can smell it. And that affords them ability to see things that we might not otherwise see if we weren't touching that spot. But the problem is, is that if you just view that spot as the entirety of reality, then you're in trouble. You need to talk to each other. The idea was an invitation to the reader to look at it from a different perspective. And I view this, this, this whole, whole white paper in Mimetic Tribes and the frame that this is a multipolar, almost postmodern war is, is sort of a psychoactive drug. Because if you see 
the, the mimetic tribe that you belong to alongside all these other mimetic tribes. That might jog you out of uh, your belief system just for a moment. And then he introduces this concept, which I think is absolutely central to navigating this culture war of mimetic mediation between the tribes. How do we mediate amongst all these warring tribes? And I view mimetic mediation as the hard problem of culture war 2.0. But there's things that we're experimenting with in Toronto called the anti-debate, where it's sort of a, a gamification of understanding. Um, there, there's conversational modalities like empathy circles, where they apply Carl Rogers' active listening to a four-way conversation. Um, getting people to look at news sites, uh, meta news sites like All Sides, that kind of shows the bias of each news platform on one issue. So in the last few months, Peter has actually set up his own channel called The Stoa, where he'll be doing some of this mimetic mediation between the different tribes, which I'll put in the show notes below. Now, one of the key issues in any mediation, which I know from my time as a foreign affairs journalist, is that you are generally at most risk from people on your own side when you enter into mediation. It takes incredible bravery on the part of someone who's high profile within a certain tribe to go into mediation anyway. And often you'll be accused of betrayal by your own side before you'll be uh, attacked by the other side. Famous example, Gandhi was killed by a Hindu nationalist because they thought he'd been too accommodating to Muslims. In Israel, Yitzhak Rabin was killed by an Orthodox Israeli because they thought he'd made too many concessions to the Palestinians. It really takes incredible bravery on behalf of the people who are involved in mediation. They've got to be of strong character. They've got to be willing to move in their positions. They've got to be willing to be accused of betrayal by the people on their side. So this is not an easy thing. And there's so many human reasons that stop us doing it, including that we may have been sort of profitably associated with a certain position. But I think some of that mediation between high profile individuals in the internet of beefs or who are willing to step away from the internet of beefs is gonna be required if we're gonna get through the next few years without widespread conflict. I promised you some signs of hope and this is where I think things are starting to move in the alternative online world. Uh, Matt Taibbi, who I referenced before, he wrote the piece where he talked about eight different revolts in different newsrooms around the US. Uh, longtime stalwart of the left, really experienced reporter at Rolling Stone, uh, just went on, so he'd written a series of pieces recently, um, including the left is the new right, where he's saying that the left has become censorious, the left has become the thing that he, as someone who was part of a counterculture, rebelled against. Now the left has become the censorious um, force, which you may argue is kind of late to the party on that one, but he's saying that. And he recently went on Brett Weinstein's podcast where he apologized to Brett for not seeing what Brett was talking about, the dangers of the radical left. I have the distinct pleasure of being here with Matt Taibbi, who is a reporter for Rolling Stone and Substack. Many of you will know him. For those who don't, you should definitely look into his writings. He has been utterly fantastic and consistent for decades on some of the most difficult topics that there are to report on. I would say he is a singular voice in journalism today. Welcome, Matt. Thank you so much for having me on, Brett. It's, a, it's an honor. Um, well, uh, I'm not quite sure where to start, I have to tell you. 2020 is proving to be a remarkable year, and I think... Uh, you and I are both seeing a disturbing and complex picture emerging, and I suppose the thing to do is just to figure out whether we can make any useful sense of it. Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, the, the first place for me that, that, that's interesting is, is uh, I think a lot of us in journalism um, are coming around slowly to the fact that we, we missed some big stories that took place uh, on campuses a few years ago. Um, you know, yours, the obviously the one in Yale. Uh, but really, you know, I, we, we've heard from academics over the years about certain things that were going on. And we, I, I think the, the reflexive um, reaction among most people in the press, and most of us are kind of liberal leaning in our political 
orientation um, was to say, okay, well, that's a right wing talking point, and you know, we're going to have trouble selling that story anyway if we try to do it, and so let's not even bother. And uh, so there was a combination of not taking it seriously, and then there's a little bit of like cancel culture already working in into the thought process with journalists because we just knew that we couldn't get that past editors, right? Um, but now, <laughs> you know, this is this has come into our business in a huge way, uh, in particular in the last couple of months, as you know. So, um, you know, people like me, I think, owe people like you an apology for coming around to this late, <laughs> if anything. Yeah. Well, I have a uh, a rule of thumb when it comes to such things, which is I welcome anybody without the need for an apology who recognizes that they got it wrong and says so. My feeling is there's a point at which you didn't get it, and this is true for all of us, and then there's a point at which you do, and you know you didn't see it as close up as we did on campuses. But anyway, thank you for acknowledging that there was something to see and that it, it wasn't seen by you and others early enough. And as predicted, Matt Taibbi is now being attacked online by a lot of people who used to support him. There's a couple of really interesting tweets just a few hours ago by Glenn Greenwald, another high-profile left-wing journalist. Watching the in-group groupthink beehive swarming by every Twitter social climber and online warrior against Matt Taibbi is amazing to behold. He's the same journalist you have admired for two decades as he mercilessly exposed the corrupt financial system and war machine. He hasn't changed. What's changed is you, your utter inability to tolerate even slight deviations from whatever orthodoxies your group holds at that moment, all driven by social media, which converts every bit of dissent into an atrocity, betrayal, heresy, in-group treason. Now, Greenwald is the journalist who broke the Edward Snowden story and was a co-founder of The Intercept. Very controversial. Personally, I disagree with him about a lot of things. But he, like Matt Taibbi, is prepared to go against the crowd, to be disagreeable. And ironically, this was one of the supposed virtues of everyone in the initial intellectual dark web. What's going on is that when you ask any large collection of people to salute a nonsensical flag and pledge allegiance to it, and more or less everyone makes the calculation, I guess if this is going to get me through my day, I'll salute any flag. Then you've got the one gal or one guy who doesn't want to. Well, my observation is that that person is usually sitting on an entire mountain of interesting thoughts that they don't have the freedom to simply make a convenience readjustment. And so from that perspective, yeah, in general, if you ask uh, a thousand people to salute a flag that makes no sense and tell them that they'll be incentivized, you'll get a thousand dollar check at the end or you know, you won't lose your job. And somebody stands up and says, no way, I'm getting out of here, do what you want. That person is usually much more interesting than just being a contrarian. That person is usually saying no because they've got an entire worldview that is uh, built by hand and, and, and bespoke. And so that's why this method of finding people has been relatively fruitful. It's people who don't back down usually don't back down for a reason because there's every reason just to go along. And just a couple of days ago, Matt Iglesias, who's one of the founders of Vox, one of the most woke publications out there, uh, recently signed the Harper's Letter of, on Free Speech and then was criticized publicly by one of Vox's employees uh, who claimed that he was, the fact that he signed the letter was making her unsafe. Matt has just agreed to go on Eric Weinstein's podcast. So I think this is the most important front in the mimetic war that's being waged at the moment. And it started to create a lot of very strange alliances. But as I've said about the intellectual dark web in the past, it's really important that it doesn't just become a reactive reactionary force against the radical left, that it actually pushes forward to a vision and a new synthesis. And there was a really interesting article in Quillette recently about how it can't just be about rejecting wokeness. Those opposing it have to offer a much more compelling moral vision of the future. So the last framework I'm gonna introduce and link to in the show notes is integral theory, which I've talked about before. Uh, Ken Wilber's integral theory, which is still, I think, the best overall framework for understanding what's going on. 
He wrote an amazing e-book after the Trump election called Trump and a Post-Truth World, how the leading edge of culture had become totally dysfunctional. So in a way, there'd been a control alt delete to an earlier operating system of tribalism. And Integral is a really, really good map. It feels like a number of the thought leaders today, and whether that's in the crypto space and thinking about kind of decentralized organizations or whether it's in existential risk or even kind of in more sophisticated versions of personal development and, and leadership development, um, I have noticed that even without teasing it out or calling it out, it kind of bubbles up in conversations that a significant number of those folks um, took on and can seriously considered integral frameworks at some point earlier in their life. Not to be taken too seriously, not to get lost in the map, as Jamie Wheel said in the film that we put out about the legacy of Integral, best to learn it and forget it. It basically was like crack for Asperger's kids. You know, the idea of getting a contact high from reading Ken's stuff and getting to see yourself on a map and position yourself up and away from, um, no matter what the disclaimers were, and there were plenty of disclaimers, the reality as that showed up in culture and in practice resulted in a bunch of dissociated eggheads masquerading as, as Jedi and thinking that they could solve the world from the position of a whiteboard. So in the integral map, we've got different value systems given different colors. And the orange value system of modernity is what arrived with the scientific revolution, a single perspective. And green is what fully arrived in the 1960s, which is postmodernism or multiple perspectives. And the positive side of that was to introduce things that were not seen from the orange perspective. It introduced the voices of people who'd been shut out of the conversation. And that was a really positive development. But what happened with green and the danger of green and why it's become so toxic and effectively dysfunctional as a system was that it insisted that all there was was multiple perspectives and that there was no truth. So Edelman and Kane, for example, that it is universally, undeniably true that there is no universal truth. Um, it'll maintain that all knowledge is social construction. It's all an interpretation. It all depends upon which culture it's arising in. And yet everything that I just said that represents the green point of view it maintains that its view is not culturally constructed. It's true for all people at all places at all time. It's not a matter of interpretation. It's got real truth. Nobody else has truth because objective truth doesn't exist. But that view itself is held to be objectively true by the postmodernists. So they do get caught up in this enormous kind of contradiction. So what Integral shows is that green has to integrate orange values to be healthy. And what it's actually been doing is attacking orange values. Green succeeded in the 60s because it rested on orange values. It fought for free speech. It insisted on the rights of everyone to be heard. And that's what actually allowed the green revolution in civil rights and different areas of the culture to succeed. But what's going on at the moment is that green is now attacking, denying, and shutting down free speech in too many different areas. And that's effectively like it's soaring off the branch that it's resting on, which is incredibly, incredibly dangerous. We're seeing things like that playing out in the culture. For example, uh, this tweet from the writer Charles Blow, arguing that it's okay for workplaces to fire employees for their views, which only works if you assume that your views are gonna be dominant in the workplace and they're only going to be sacking reprehensible bigots but it's also the same justification that would allow someone to be sacked for being homosexual or being sacked for their, for their progressive views. So it's a completely short-sighted perspective. And we're seeing genuine liberals who went through the counterculture realizing this. I'm gonna end with Matt Taibbi because he put out something absolutely hilarious the other day at the beginning of one of his podcasts on Rolling Stone. First of all, I just wanna make an announcement. I made a terrible mistake and I'm hoping somebody out there can help me. Robin D'Angelo is having a, an online seminar this weekend, and I planned to attend uh, while on hallucinogens, and I bought all the drugs, uh, but was too late in buying a ticket, uh, which oh, is, so it's already closed. So if there's somebody out there who has a ticket to this 
July 18th all day Robin DeAngelis seminar and is willing to set, I mean, I'm willing to pay almost any price, frankly. Uh, so if you have a ticket to this thing and are willing to give it to me, um, I will, I promise to eat a, a dangerous quantity of drugs and, and attend that seminar uh, this weekend and, uh, and then write about it later. Which if anyone knows the um, fear and loathing in Las Vegas, Hunter S. Thompson was the heart of psychedelic culture, taking loads of drugs and going to the Republican convention in Las Vegas. So Matt is keeping alive the true values of the psychedelic counterculture, the irreverence and subversion, because he understands in a way that I think not enough people on the left have yet understood that someone like Robin DiAngelo is Nurse Ratchet from One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. She's now the dominant force in the culture, a number one bestseller, charging $12,000 for a corporate consulting gig, enforcing conformity and compliance. Thanks for watching. I'd love to get some suggestions for mimetic mediation. Who are the people that should be in dialogue with each other, that could be in dialogue with each other, that could see each other's point of view and could have a generative conversation? Because this is what we're going to come to later in the series, talking about what a generative conversation looks like. And also in the next film, I'm going to talk about bad faith, how it's kind of a very slippery concept, but it's a central issue to deal with if we want to move forward because it's very easy to use that as a way of shutting down the conversation. So thanks for watching and see you soon. Rebel Wisdom was set up to make sense of the world at a deeper level than the mainstream media. It was built for these times of crisis and change, which is why we want to do what we can to meet the challenge of the times. More films, and also for our Rebel Wisdom members, weekly sense-making calls with our amazing interviewees. And also, we're introducing the Wisdom Gym, a place to practice some of the skills that we've talked about on the channel. Thanks for watching, and see you soon.